Hello everyone and welcome to today's Art Chat, Problem Solving with Creativity and Passion with Karen Whitworth. My name is Sarah Alspaugh and I'm the webinar specialist here in the fine art community at F&W. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. If you have any questions, whether they're a technical question or a question for Linda or Karen, please type that into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel and I'll address those technical issues as they come in and then we'll have some time at the end to ask your questions to Karen and Linda. So type those questions as they come to you and I will relay those on for you. All right, well without further ado, I'll turn things over to Linda and uh, you can take it away. Welcome you guys. Thanks, Karen. Or thanks, Sarah. Um, I actually have been looking forward to this talk with Karen for a while. We've been um, texting back and forth on Facebook, and I had found out that she's actually calling in from Paris. I knew that beforehand, so I'm so jealous. <laughs> I'm sure you've <laughs> eaten so much of those uh, chocolate pans and and all those wonderful croissants by now, Karen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lots of bread, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, before we jump into the, the, you know, where where you've been and stuff like that, I just wanted to say a, a special hello to some folks um, down in North Carolina. I call them the Plain Air Ladies because these these uh, four came and saw me when I was down in North Carolina, and we had a really wonderful talk uh, for a couple hours, and um, their dedication really really sh uh, shone through. And I know that um, they're probably out there listening, so I just wanted to say hi, throw a hi out that that way, and um, then. Uh, that's really just basically all I wanted to do. I'll mention some stuff uh, back at the end of this talk, um, but I want to get to Karen because I know that her husband gets off of work shortly and they're going to go out and experience uh, France the best they can. So um, I was talking with Karen a little bit uh, beforehand and I actually asked her um, where she was from and, and where she's living now because I saw on Facebook it says Washington, uh, but you actually lived in Alaska for 20 years and a lot about what we're going to be talking about um, has to come with the fact that you're out away from major cities that have a whole lot of collectors and you've really put a lot of passion and energy into building up your art business beyond just selling your paintings and that's basically what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about a couple um, things that people would say were problems but you looked at as opportunities and Part of that is always your your very positive attitude. I always I, I put warnings out on that. It's like your positive <laughs> energy is contagious, <laughs> and that's a good thing. That is a really good thing. So um, anyway, Karen, tell us a little bit about your background um, and you know where you lived and and things like that to start off. Okay. Okay, well, thanks so much for having me, Linda. I'm really excited to share a little bit about this topic with everyone. It's something I'm really passionate about. So hopefully um, everybody can, mm -hmm. you know, learn something and, that they can apply to their own creative endeavors. Um, when I was about eight years old, my family moved to Alaska. We didn't know anybody there. It was um, it was a new frontier for sure. And the place where we lived was rather rural and being, you know, a, a young child who is really into art and, you know, it's not like we could just go down to the museum and, you know, drool over the beautiful masterpieces, you know, it wasn't something that I had access to. So naturally I really clung to any form of art that I could find. Oftentimes it would, you know, be um, really pretty illustrated books or calendars or um, cards that you'd find at the grocery store, um, things like that, that you'd f just find in everyday places. I loved when school would start because you get all these different kinds of um, folders, you know, with the beautiful artwork on the front, and um, that was another source of inspiration for me. So I personally really have a um, appreciation for the um, art on different merchandise because I I know firsthand how it can affect people's lives in ways that oftentimes you know as artists we don't even realize um, let's see here um, when I was a probably early teenager my um, my family really saw my passion in art and they started enrolling me in local art classes at the local art supply mm -hmm. store and that was really awesome because I got to experiment with the different um, 
mediums and be surrounded by other people who enjoyed art and I it was it was really addicting. I couldn't get enough of it. And when I was old enough, that same art supply store ended up hiring me. It was my first job. And it was so cool to see, you know, the business side of art and art supplies and what goes into a small business, you know. Yeah, a manager may be calling the shots, but they're also taking out the garbage, you know, things that, you know, you would never associate, you know, just as, you know, a customer walking in the door. And so that was really enlightening for me as well. Um, shortly thereafter, I ended up being hired by um, one of my original instructors. Um, he taught me how to paint in oils, and he ended up needing an assistant. And so he hired me, and I got to kind of shadow him in the studio, help him out, um, everyday tasks from you know making phone calls, taking out the trash, you know everything that you can possibly imagine. I probably had my finger in it one way or the other. And so that was really enlightening as well because I got to see firsthand how an artist could operate a business and do it successfully. And I also saw how there can right. be a um, conflict of um, time between nurturing your passion and investing into marketing of your products. And so that was something I I feel like I had a little bit of added insight that I had to, when I went to start my own business, I needed to set my guard for that, you know, be careful not to let, you know, chasing after a sale take over the entire purpose of this profession from the get-go. So right. when I, um, right. in 2007, when my youngest um, was born, I uh, left my job with the artist and I went full-time artist with my own work. And so that was a kind of shell-shocking experience, you know, it's it's totally different when you've got somebody else telling you exactly what needs to be done to, you know, yeah. get a good outcome to when you have to do it by yourself. You get to choose what you're going to do and you're the one that gets to pay the consequences ultimately. And so that was um, a big adventure and of course, you know, having two very young children, that was exciting. but. Um, I, I knew in order to bring in some income to cover, um, you know, that lost wage that I had for my previous job, that I had to come up with some way to still be in this area that I'm passionate about, but yet, you know, have a reliable source of income. So for that period of my life, it was, I purchased a Jacle printer and I offered printing for all of my artist friends. You know, I mm -hmm. printed my own work and then I'd print everybody else's work and it it helped me kind of find the groove of supply and demand and, you know, managing inventory and, you know, creating a um, a product that was desirable and, and all that goes with that. So that was really, really awesome to um, get a handle on that. Um, through that period of my career, um, having started working full-time for myself, I I found a local sales rep in a neighboring town, and she travels around to um, tourist towns around the state of Alaska and meets with um, retail shops that carry Alaskan-themed gifts and whatnot, and she um, reps my art to these shops. And so as a result of that relationship, my art was able to expand the territory exponentially. And as a result, I now had a way to get my products out and it kind of snowballed from there that I was able to create other products that kind of filled that niche. And it was um, mm -hmm. through a prolonged series of trial and error and experimenting. And, you know, there is, there is no defined or perfect path for this course, but, you know, a lot of trial and error, and we found some some pretty cool ways to attach my art to items that were either functional or just plain adorable and um, affordable for everybody. <laughs> right. So, so um, oh, go ahead. Are you done? Um, I was just going no, to I say was, I didn't want to jump in, but I, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> two um, two years ago. <laughs> My husband got a job in the Seattle area, and so we kind of packed up the house mm -hmm. and headed south. Um, it was a crazy wild time of transition for about um, 
18 months in the process of moving to waiting for a house to sell and then being in a tiny apartment and all that. But we're finally in um, oh, our wow. new home now, and I my studio is back set up. And um, it's really exciting because I'm able to use this opportunity to kind of recalibrate my, um, my focus as an artist. And I feel that um, as artists that are self-employed in general, it's all – always important for us to recalibrate our focus and um, you know my landmark was pretty large you know using a move as this purpose but it's always good to use any type of um, moment in time to just be like okay let's let's refocus where are we going how does this get me where I want to be eventually and for me that is always focusing on nurturing that passion that I have you know um, doing the things that excite me and um, in my art, but also in the products that I create and maintaining that focus throughout. So now that I live in Seattle and it's a little bit less of a tourist market than it was in Alaska, I'm starting to branch out into figurative and portrait work. And so that's really exciting. I'm having a lot of fun with that. So that's about where I am right now. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen a couple of, yeah, I've seen a couple of your portraits and um, the, the uh, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank on her name. The one with the book, Jalen? Jalen? Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the reading the book, Jalen, I think her name is. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was beautiful. I showed that to my art students and said, this is Karen, and she's going to be on my show. <laughs> so, oh, that's awesome. And they were just, I mean, jaws dropped. Yeah, jaws dropped. It was it was beautiful. Aww. I really, really, really enjoyed looking at that one. and. And talking about that one a little bit, you know, like look how she used the color compliments and look, you know, so it was great teaching tool. So thank you, Karen. <laughs> so, oh, that makes but, me um, happy. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was like I said, I, I enjoyed looking at it and wanted them to experience that. So um, before we actually get into some problem solving, um, let's talk a little, you touched a little bit on it uh, when you were giving us your background, which, you know, you could have went one of two ways with everything that was thrown at you, uh, but you know you, you decided to stay positive, and that's a really hard things to do. So I, you know, compliments on that, and um, you know you really, and I'm assuming that your mentor uh, that you were the assistant for actually helped to, you to stay positive and you know look at the bright side and things like that too. So um, I'm sure there was a lot of, of very positive people in your life that that could get you there. Um, but before we start talking some different problem solvings and stuff like that, one of the big things that um, everyone uh, seems to think of and would like to blame is the, the art market today. And, you know, it's like, I can't do that because my art doesn't fit the fine, you know, fit a quote unquote fine art artist career or, you know, um, that's not the art market that I want to be in. Those type of comments seem to come up. and. Um, you know, I see you creating wonderfully beautiful fine art pieces, and then I also see this other side of you, like what we have in front of us on the screen, the wildflower seeds from Alaska that has pictures of, you know, some of the flowers that you've painted. So talk a little bit about what you, you know, just tell us your thoughts on the art market today. Sure. It's, um, wow, that's a big topic. <laughs> But um, I totally mm -hmm. agree with you. It is something yeah, that is very popular. Hour. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's a topic that I hear a lot <laughs> also with people um, being very discouraged about the the way that they view the market right now. And the way I see it is that it is probably the most accessible that it has been that I can imagine right now. Um, thanks to the internet and our ability to make contact with artists. We no longer need a gallery. Don't get me wrong, I love my galleries and they do an awesome job at connecting with their clients. But it is no longer a mm -hmm. necessity, it is an option. And so we mm -hmm. have to decide as artists how we are going to utilize this tool. And um, one of the benefits you know, of the internet is that there is somebody out there who is interested in buying any possible type of art that you can possibly imagine or create for that matter. And so um, I feel it is most beneficial for you to focus on what you are passionate about creating and then find a way to get it to the people who also identify with 
either that genre, that style, that subject matter, whatever that microclimate of art may be, own it. It's what you're passionate mm -hmm. about. And that's going to carry you much farther than you settling for a style or subject or whatever that you're less passionate about, but you're trying to make a buck off of it. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with making a buck. We need it. Everybody's got to eat, right? But eventually, if we're going after it for the wrong reasons, we're going to burn out. And it's not going to take us as far as searching for that passion will. So I, I feel that because of that internet right. access, we have a way to connect with our collectors that, you know, just 15 years ago wasn't possible. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, there's, um, you mentioned one little, little key thing in there that I think is really, really important. If this, if doing a certain thing isn't your passion, isn't what you're interested in, and you're just trying to do it, you know, to make a buck, it's going to feel like work. It's not going to feel like something that's fun to do. And and that that's a real key. And absolutely. the other part of that key is figuring out what you are passionate about and um, you know there's a, a number of different things that you can look at on the web there's a tool that I have out there called um, setting your objectives your goals and your strategies and your measurements and you know when you're filling out these these things you're really you know writing down what your objective is you know I want to be a fine art artist or I want you know I want people to buy my greeting cards whatever the objective is um, you know, you have to come up with strategies to do that. And if any point in that time that you're creating this little chart that can be very flexible, um, you find yourself oh, saying, I don't want to do this, scratch it <laughs> off the list. Because it isn't going to get done, right? It isn't going to get done. Yeah, have you ever, have you crossed that opportunity where you just said, I'm not going to be able to do this. I just don't have, I don't want to do it. Oh, so. absolutely. And usually it happens after I've committed to doing it. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't much different. So, <laughs> so but uh, yeah, it's I totally agree. Um, and a lot of times, th this is another opportunity for seeing the glass half empty or half full. I mean, every time you commit to or find yourself doing something that you don't like, that is one step closer to finding the thing that you do like. And so it's not necessarily that you've wasted all this time doing something that didn't work out or isn't what you want to be doing. It's um, it's learning more about yourself and how you can um, get that much closer to what you're passionate about. Right. And it's and I always say, give yourself permission to say it's okay to let it go because some people will let it go and then they'll beat themselves up because they didn't do it. And I've done it too, and that's why I'm laughing. So, But yeah, <laughs> always give yourself permission to say, you know, I'm really just not going to do that. And and it's okay because that isn't your passion. Your passion lies somewhere else. So mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, one of the things that we've been doing on uh, the last, I'd say, well, this whole year basically with Art Chats, we've been focusing on um, kind of rebirthing ourselves from our thinking of, we're artists to we're creative entrepreneurs, and I asked you to be on the show because I was, you know, actually we're friends on Facebook, like we mentioned. But you know, I see your your statuses and and all that, and I'm thinking, oh, here's somebody that really thinks like a creative entrepreneur. She doesn't just see herself as an artist, but as as an entrepreneur and what she a be passionate about, b bring to the people, you know, that she's connected with in her audience and. You know, I, I just um, I just want you to think about or, or talk about a little bit how you got yourself to thinking outside of the box, if you will. Um, you know, tell us about some of your endeavors too while you're doing this, like the, like we said, the wildflowered seas, and you've got a group of people that you uh, painters, I'm assuming, called painted ladies, mm -hmm. and um, and I think we'll save the uh, the next question on that. Uh, about that uh, painted ladies uh, as for uh, after you get done telling us about you know how you changed from just thinking of an artist to thinking of more creative and, and more entrepreneurial things to do with your art sure um, yeah I I feel as artists there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to have our cake and eat it too <laughs> um, I know historically right. um, artists are, you know, we're limited to selling originals, and that's just how it worked. Some of that, I think, probably had to do with technology, but things have changed. You know, 
paintings are no longer the only source of wall decor that people have access to. You know, 175 years ago, right. if somebody wanted an image for their wall, they hired an artist or bought a painting from an artist. Now there's photographs and, you know, wall canvas things that you can pick up at the department store. And there's all sorts of things that have entered the market since that um, business model, you know, was the, um, the only source uh, you know, to look at for artists. So I think it's important that we don't um, kind of keep ourselves in a box in how we approach our art and let our our passion dictate how we, you know, operate our business. As I mentioned, you know, how I have that connection to um, art merchandising, you know, from my childhood. I, I feel very strongly about making art accessible, both um, financially mm -hmm. and convenience um, for those who, who are interested in it. Um, also, you know, I don't, I feel like creativity doesn't stop when you sign the name on your finished painting. I think that is um, not the case at all, and that by exploring methods to express ourselves by taking this artwork that we spent so much time, you know, in the preparation and the execution, but then to give it a a second life in other forms is is creativity as well, and so I enjoy exploring those um, those options. It's it's actually really enjoyable for me to come up with different ways to um, to express my art on products. You know, it's it's not just slapping an image and be like, all right, there you go, send it on its way. I mean, like with the mm -hmm. seeds um, that are on the the screen right now. When I was um, coming up with that product line, I knew. I absolutely love gardening. I love flowers. So this was a really natural fit for me. Again, I'm trying to stay true to my passion and, you know, do things that excite me. Um, there are other right. companies and other entities that provide wildflower seeds to the Alaska gift market. So I knew I had competition. So mm -hmm. not just creativ creatively speaking, but also from a business standpoint, I needed to stand out in the crowd somehow. So I um, I had created the seed packets with the little twine hangers on the top and also the display that they hang on. And so the display features one of my paintings also, and it's very vibrant and colorful with brass fixtures. And um, it's just really um, cute. It's got antique flourishes on it. And then the twine hangers, they they allow the seed packet to double as like an ornament or a wine charm or a gift tag for a present or, you know, any number of ways that somebody could envision using them. And, you know, these seed packets are being sold for like anywhere from $3.50 to $4 at gift shops around Alaska. And so it's very affordable for tourists to pick up. And, you know, it's not some a purchase that they're going, oh, I don't know, you know, it's, am I... You know, is this going to hurt the bank? You know, they, they can buy one for everybody back home and take it home with them. So um, when I was designing the product line, I was trying to, you know, find a creative way to fill these different situations and um, just express my creativ creativity in, in these ways too, not just with the, the original painting itself. So... Um, as a result, we've, this was our first season with these seeds, but the sales were absolutely incredible, many times over what we expected. So, I mean, that's awesome, but it put us in a big pinch trying to um, keep up with demand. <laughs> so um, it was just really fun to see how me putting in that extra effort at the beginning end, and I say effort, but really it was kind of like... Um, playtime because you're solving problems, which is a lot like creating a painting, in my opinion. A painting is just a series of corrections, and creating products like this is very much the same thing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it really, yeah, I mean, it really does take it, um, you know, one step further. I mean, it, it's, it's recalibrating your mind from, okay, I signed the painting, it's, you know, now I need to go find a gallery to show it or I need to have some kind of show to show it. It's going one step, you know, it's even one step further than I'm just going to put it on Facebook and see what happens <laughs> or I'm going to, you know, take a picture and put it on Instagram. You know, 
this is really taking the thinking one step further. It's you know what what's a need out there that I can fill with my artwork that I'm going to enjoy doing is kind of the question I guess you get to ask when you sign your name on the painting. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's fun to yeah, think. So um, I actually have people contact me and be like, oh, we just we just saw your work. We just found out about you because we got a bunch of seeds and. It's just so awesome to connect <laughs> with people. You know, this is this is our way of connecting with them, and and people really are excited about it. Right. So it's um, I I really want artists to understand it's nothing to you know feel discouraged about. Like oh well, you know I guess I'm gonna have to make some cards because my originals aren't selling. You know that it's not that one's better than the other. It's just that one has a different price point than the other and caters to a different demographic. Well, and I think that, that that's really important too because as we stop educating our children on fine art through art in school, you know, just art education versus all the way up to, okay, let's all you know, sit down and create art. That, that's going away in the school. I was having a conversation with, um, well, the folks down in North Carolina and said, you know, I don't, ex I don't understand why everybody keeps saying, you know, people aren't going to buy art, you know, and I'm like, we're, we're training them not to buy art. We're, you know, the fine art that collectors are becoming less and less and less, and that's, mm -hmm. they don't know what, they don't know what to look for, you know, it's like, unless we tell them. As, as artists, unless we go out of our way and, and start to, to re-educate them on, on what things are, you know, what fine art is and, and things like that, this market is going to continue to get bigger and bigger because everybody loves beautiful pictures and beautiful cards and beautiful paintings per se, but the money, the disposable income to buy that is, you know, shrinking. If they can pay, you know, if they have that much money together, they're going to go on a vacation. <laughs> You know, right. unfortunately, you know, maybe it's, instead of buying art. So, yeah, the market is is really dynamic right now in that if you can find the right price point for your paintings, that's great, but you can't lose money either. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you have to cover your supply. And, and um, you know, these are ways that people can get connected with you and then turn around and, you know, when they do have some disposable incomes, it, it's almost like you're, <laughs> this is so funny, it's almost like you're planting a seed that's going to grow into somebody who's going to turn around and say, you know, I just have to have one of Karen's paintings. Yes, and, and that's something that I, I hope um, happens down the road. We've had some of it happen so far, and I hope it continues to grow. So I totally agree. Right. Yeah. And then um, talk, tell us a little bit about Painted Ladies, and I know that you have an announcement that you want to share with us, too, in that regard. Sure. Yeah, um, so the Painted Ladies is a group of uh, women artists. We started getting together back in Alaska before I moved um, several years ago. Basically, it started out as just like a weekly painting get-together thing. Um, several of us had kids at home, and it was just so nice to be able to have a place where we could go, not have to worry about, you know, the kids are going to be crazy and paint and socialize and it ended up growing into a really wonderful group. We were able to encourage each other to pursue our our careers and our um, artistic goals and we held each other accountable. I noticed in my own personal art walk that I I grew way more when I was part of the Painted Ladies than before the group formed. And that's something that I encourage um, artists to do also, is find some fellow artists who you feel like you can trust, that you really get along with, and just really lock into those relationships because it's so easy to get isolated and, you know, we're often our worst critics and when you're isolated like that, it, it can really um, paralyze any amount of growth and to avoid that it really helps to have somebody who can hold you accountable and you know whether you're on your high horse and thinking you're doing awesome, you're like, dude, your nose is so crooked right now <laughs> you know, when you're working on a portrait <laughs> and it's a safe place. It's okay. You know that they have your best intentions at heart. So 
but also when you're really down and out about something, you know, maybe you entered a competition and you didn't get in and it's really nice to have somebody that you can vent to and just express your frustration to and know that, you know, they got your back and they, they're going to reassure you, you know, just because you didn't get into a competition or a jury show, that doesn't mean that your art sucks. It means that that one judge or that team had something else in mind. That's all it means. And so having these people in your life who can kind of bridge the gap between the mountaintops and the valleys um, is really beneficial. And um, over time, the Painted Ladies kind of evolved um, into a business because we saw other artists needing these, um, these relationships. And we also noticed that there were events that were being hosted um, around the country that, you know, were awesome opportunities for artists to get together, both socialize, but also nurture, nurture these, these relationships. And so being in Alaska, again, we're, you know, don't really have access to a whole lot in the um, art world, we decided to start hosting these type of events where artists could come. You know, it was a safe environment. We might have a little friendly competition, but it was, it was all in the spirit of furthering and promoting each other and not cutting, you know, one person down to benefit the other. And so that these events kind of evolved over the last several years. And last year we had our first plane air cruise where we cruised through the inside passage of Alaska on Princess Cruises. And we had 70 people in our party on the boat. It was pretty awesome. And, um, it was actually my first time on a cruise ship. I had never been on a cruise ship before. I'm like, oh, my first time. I think I'll take 70 people with me, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> it um, worked out really great. It was so nice to be pampered, you know, have incredible, you know, amazing food, and um, be surrounded by this incredible beauty. You know, the, you've got mountains on either side and right. whales, and it was just awesome. And we even um, were able to squeeze in several um, uh, model painting sessions, and it was just great. So our next one's going to be in 2016. Um, it's round trip out of Seattle. It's seven days, and it is on Princess Cruises. So we're really excited to be doing it again. We had such a great time. We want another helping. Well, there you go. So. Um can they find that information on your website or? Yes, it is at plainairalaska.com. Okay, so plainairalaska.com is the information on the Painted Lady Cruise with Princess Cruises that's coming up. So thanks for announcing that on the show, and um, you know you you'll have to like drop me texts every once in a while or something from from the cruise and let me know how it's going. So is it in 2016? Oh, yeah. you, you have a month plan. Oh, um, no, it's in June. So June 25th is when it in departs June. from Seattle. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I did a uh, inside passage. It was on Royal Caribbean, but um, but they, you see each other. <laughs> the boats see yeah. each other at all the different ports and stuff, But um, yeah, which is kind of funny. It's like, oh, yeah, there they are. But uh, mm -hmm. it is gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. I just remember sitting on the, the teak deck on a chase lounge and just watching the scenery go by, and mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it is great. Uh, it, it, yeah, if, if I would do another cruise, it would be the Alaskan cruise. Um, so... For sure, <laughs> it's, I, I mean, I, just thinking about it, I get—it's just breathtaking. So, so we're gonna—I'm gonna remind everybody here that if you have a question for Karen as we go through this, please type it in. Sarah's going to keep tabs on those questions, and um, we've got uh, about 25 minutes left left that Karen and I are gonna chat to one another, and then you'll have an opportunity for the questions to be asked um, here at the end. So let's um, sw switch gears a little bit, Karen, and talk about. Um, branding. Do you see yourself as creating a brand? Um, That's if a good not, kind of tell us how you're thinking. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So when when that topic comes up, and 
It actually, my husband and I talk about it a lot. He used to work for a um, marketing agency, and I was always fascinated by, you know, the different approaches that they would take to, you know, promote or market their clients. And so when I think about how I market my own work and branding and all that, I, I guess I am the brand. And so as long as I stay true to what I'm passionate about, then I can't go wrong. Now, if I was passionate about politics, that probably would not be a good brand, brand choice. <laughs> but um, <laughs> like that are best left for, you know, private uh, conversations. But things like, okay, I'm passionate about painting flowers or painting people, like um, going to museums, like all of these things that I'm passionate about fits into who I am and my art. Um, as artists, we're really um, blessed that what we create is so personal that it kind of becomes natural as far as how we communicate our creations because they are part of us. And so, um, you know, really tapping into that um, personal connection is always a safe bet to go when um, promoting your work and um, kind of designing your approach to how you're communicating your products to your demographic of um, collectors or customers. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. And there is a difference between there is a difference between branding and image, uh, for sure. And um, it, it's a fine line, but there is a difference there. Branding is you know, very much uh, what Karen was just talking about. These are things that fit Karen's psyche, if you will, naturally, and she can um, she doesn't have to worry about her image, if you will, because she is doing things that are true to her. Where Image is more of a, a personification or a, a projection of um, what fits, why well, I always say what fits nicely into the social network that you're in. So, right. you know, you may, you may uh, appear a certain way in public, uh, but behind the scenes you may be totally different. And if you brand yourself on the things that you're passionate about and the things that you love to do and you are yourself, and people love you because you are yourself, you never have to worry about your image. So it's only point. when you're presenting a fake, yeah, it's only when you're presenting an, an, a, a fake image that you really need to worry about what's going on <laughs> oh behind scenes and, and who has a camera to snap a picture. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you don't have to worry about it because like I said, these, you've been, <laughs> you're great, you don't have to worry. <laughs> Unless of course you're personifying a fake image and then we have to talk, Karen, but. <laughs> no, yeah, I was just imagining, you know, it must be really stressful, you know, to to design a imitation, you know, personification that you were describing. I mean, that would be very stressful, but when, you know, like you said, you focus on the things that are true to your very essence, you, you can't go wrong. Right, exactly. So, wonderful conversation, and then everything that, that Karen is developing underneath, like, for example, the bag tags, which I think is a wonderful idea. Not only does, you know, Another blue luggage piece goes by, but yeah. <laughs> and these, the bag tags, you knew exactly which bags were yours coming off of the uh, conveyor mm -hmm. belt there in Paris, I'm sure. And anybody who pulls that bag up and sees this bag tag and says, oh, this mm -hmm. isn't mine, but you've already, it's like, wow, look how, how individual your bag became in that sea of, of um, bags coming off of the conveyor belt. Great oh, idea. I'm so glad you like it. Yeah, I, I'm also passionate about travel, so this was another kind of natural um, course of action for me. And um, I also love um, fashion and cute things, and you know, it doesn't need to be utilitarian. Like, how can we make this more attractive, right? Right. So this, right. this it just kind of made itself, and it was a lot of fun to um, even sourcing of the materials was fun and. You know, if, if this was a task that I set on myself to make a dollar and I wasn't interested in, oh my goodness, I would probably be pulling out my hair. But because it is something that I enjoy, it, it doesn't feel like work. Right. So the, let's talk a minute about, because I know there's probably going to be a question about this, the, the sourcing of materials like this. Did you like spend hours on the internet to find the little, little belt that goes at the top of this and 
what actually is the bag tag made of and was sure. it like um, sending your I image spent away and two days somebody... looking for the buckles. <laughs> it was um okay. <laughs> uh, pretty I don't know. It was intense because you know, you see these things out in the wild, you know they exist. You know, they got to be out there somewhere, right. but um the way that you know finding stuff on the internet goes you're at the mercy of how descriptive the retailer was in their listing so um, it, it did take me quite a while to find exactly what I needed for the purpose that I I had in mind um, that is another thing that I encourage artists to um, to really spend extra time on because that extra couple hours that you spend researching online could end up saving you hundreds of dollars down the road or um, could end up making a product feasible when otherwise it would not have been. So I am a huge, huge right. promoter of research and you know this this goes into art too. I mean it's not just uh, merchandising that you should be researching your materials and, and your subject. Um, you know like for the luggage tags I had to make sure that my product was um, had a comparable price point to those that compete against it, you know, and doing your homework that way too. Um, that applies to art. I mean, you don't want to price a six by six inch painting at eight thousand dollars, and you probably don't want to price it at a really low price either. It's it's smart to have a a pulse on what's going on around you, and by doing your homework like that, you're saving yourself a lot of headache down the road. Right, and the um, but but you, you kind of mentioned it, and I'll just throw it out there uh, real quick. But you know, you were saying that you're probably not making a lot of profit on this. Um, I think I heard the word a dollar. <laughs> so, um, get yeah, yeah, that, that word designed for kind of like, um, wholesale market. Okay. Oh, mhm. Mm exactly. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're getting there. Okay, so the wholesale market, um, when you're selling to other businesses, they have to turn around and sell it again. So whatever you charge, the final retail price will probably be, um, so like, let's say, um, this is not the price that these are, but let's say I'm charging $2 for these, and then I sell it to another business, and then they have to to make money off of it. So they're probably going to double or two and a half times what they paid for it. And then that will end up being the retail price. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean it's it's not dissimilar to what you see at a gallery. But the nice thing about wholesale is that these businesses pay up front or 30 day net. There's no consignment or, you know, well maybe we will, maybe we won't sell them. You know, like it's it's a done deal. They purchase the product, no wondering, you know, if it's going to pan out or not. So that's also really, um, really great. And they also pay for shipping, which a lot of galleries, you end up delivering the art to them at your own expense. So there's a lot of perks to the wholesale market that don't apply to consignment in galleries. But um, as you mentioned, you know, the price point does not allow for a massive chunk of change, but the profit margin percentage is actually pretty darn good. Um, I, I feel really, really comfortable about it. And, um, you know, like the seeds, for example, um, we, we sold several thousand units of seeds this year. So one piece mm -hmm. may not seem like a lot, but when they add up, you know, it, it quickly turns into a very substantial number. Right. Okay, so um, <laughs> I'm laughing because there's like this dark side question that's popping into my <laughs> head, <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out a really, really, you know, um, nice way to put this. But, but, and you and I have talked about this on text, and it has to do with, with uh, artists like, you know, Bob Ross and, Oh my God! Should I say it, Thomas Kincaid? Mm -hmm. You know, and and how you know the art world seems to like come back and attack these guys, and mm -hmm. and yet they're doing they're following their passion, and well mm -hmm. they were they're both not with us any longer, but you know they were a household name, they were following their passion, um, they got me interested in art, 
Uh, and you know, I, I was—it was really kind of interesting too because I actually had seen some Thomas Kincaid impressionist work that wasn't the you know Walt Disney castles, if you will. It was mm -hmm. you know he, he went out plain air and painted, and, and they were fabulous. I mean, I, you know, I have to I have to give him credit for those because they were wonderful paintings. But yet, the backlash that that he got for making money, <laughs> along with I know he did some things with galleries and stuff like that, which was you know. Mm -hmm that we, we won't get into, but, you know, there is such a, uh, a uh, I can't do that because it takes away the fine art uh, label or it does, or I can't be a fine art artist and do these kind of marketing and merchandising things because it, it lowers my art. And we kind of had a conversation about that in, in, in text where we just basically said, no, it doesn't, not, not really. This is kind of like the new market, right? Right, I totally agree, and I feel um, I feel like it, it can be so easy to um, what's what's the phrase armchair quarterback um, other artists exactly yes um, so I and it's also really hard to know whether or not they are in fact pursuing their passion so it, it's probably best that we don't criticize other artists for not doing what makes them happy. Um, we can only, you We're know, doing say what that. Makes them happy. <laughs> exactly, and and we can only just say that for ourselves. And so, um, you know, that's something that I I try to keep in mind, and I encourage other people to do that too. I mean, in the end, if if you're happy and you're pursuing your art and you're sharing it with other people and they're buying it, I mean, I'm just. I don't know. I'm I'm not seeing the downside to any of this, right? Like we're we're seeing all right, of these right, positives, right. and the only negative that I can think of is like, oh well, there would be critics. But you know, are those critics buying you dinner? Are those critics helping you sleep well at night? Um, you know, they they may be <laughs> causing you a bellyache, but in the end, unfortunately, they're they're just squeaky wheels. Um, the big things in life don't revolve around what they say. It has to do with are you feeding your passion? Are you being genuine to yourself and um, pursuing that with all you have? And so that's kind of how yeah. I feel about that topic. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting from the standpoint, because I'll, I'll throw this out, one of the most respected galleries in Cincinnati, which I am a part of, um, and they represent my original paintings, uh, you know, one of my goals had always been, I'm I'm gonna go get and be represented by galleries, etc. Which you know was a great goal, and and it happened, and and, and yay, <laughs> you know I I was very very happy about that. And one of the conversations that I had with the gallery uh, owner was, you know, hey, you know I I kind of make some money on cards with um, my paintings on them, and and all this other type of merchandise that's out there at Fine Art America and you know now that I'm in a gallery do I have to stop that and I was really expecting the word no or yes I mean yes you have to stop mm -hmm. that because it lowers your art you know that whole conversation was gonna happen and it's really kind of interesting because the gallery owner said no you don't have to stop that and he said you know basically we understand with that this is kind of the new market and um, I can't ask you to stop doing that this is your work and you own it and you know it's your copyright and if you want to do that that's fine now do all of the um, people the collectors want to see that and you know quite honestly if, if a collector bought my painting um, from the gallery and then said you know hey Linda I, I really don't want that out on on greeting cards etc I take it off you know I mean mm -hmm. they, they bought the painting so, so not a problem but you know I really thought that that whole change by the gallery owner to say no stay out there keep doing that because you know in a roundabout way I'm advertising for them absolutely absolutely there's there's a lot to be said so, for product placement and recognition and you know um, gaining a following on your own effort you absolutely are advertising for them I agree yeah, so um, all of the, you know, this is all part of, part of the marketing plan that, that you need to develop for yourself. And again, you know, we're not saying that what Karen is doing or what I'm doing or what 
artist A, B, C, or D is doing is going to be right for you. Again, you have to find that way to brand yourself and what you feel comfortable in your skin doing. And if and if that is just working with galleries, have at it, and, mm -hmm. and we love it. So you know, if it's if it's doing these creative things, taking your creativity one step further to you know solve that problem of money income or whatever the next problem um, that might be facing you just you know what we're trying to do is coach folks to say you know into some entrepreneurial type thinking and and how to to think a little bit differently in the realm of what works for you what feels good to you what's your passion so um, with that having to say because we're kind of getting into it um, it's you know what? What do you say to the artist that says, "I tried all that stuff, and no one signs up for my workshop, or no one buys my art, or no one shows up at the events I plan. They they don't read my blogs. They won't buy my cards." <laughs> so, kind of, you know, there's a big negative trend here. And besides saying, "Well, just your attitude," what, <laughs> what right. do you say? Well, um, all of those things don't happen by chance. There is a cause and effect. And so, you know, it's just a matter of deciphering what that cause and effect is. Uh, one of the first products that I created with my artwork on them, you know, in, in hopes to create affordable um, art items for people to purchase was a miniature framed um, jacle print. So it's this teeny tiny little paper print, it's like about two by three inches, and I hand sign each one of them. And then I put them in a little ornate gold frame that has a little ribbon and they make adorable ornaments or they can sit in your bookshelf and another thing that I was planning on accomplishing with these products was I kept getting the response from potential customers that oh I don't have any more wall space so I was like doggone it everybody's got wall space for a 2 by 3 print right so I was like this is gonna <laughs> fill so many voids and um, so I signed up for a Christmas gift fair with a friend of mine. We had a booth. We had um, we set up a Christmas tree, and I printed up some of um, these little products for her as well because she had her art printed with me on my printer, and um, we were so excited and got tons of attention, but not not hardly any sold. Like maybe a couple. You know, it's a three-day event. And I'm like, what on earth is wrong mm -hmm. with these things? We know they're adorable and they serve all of these purposes. Why are they not selling? And on the last day, <laughs> this couple, um, these two women come up to us with, they each picked out one. They had really labored over their decisions. And they're like, are these originals? It was $9.95. I was about ready to die when they <laughs> asked me that. And I'm like, what on earth am I doing wrong? That not only do they think I'm selling my originals for $9.95, but they're not selling if that's what they think they are. Like, they should be flying <laughs> off the tree if that's what's going on. So, you know, it would have been really easy to just walk away and be like, well, I tried it. I put in good effort. It didn't work out. So, you know, I guess that wasn't meant to be. But I, I knew that it filled a bunch of really convenient niches. So I, um, I found somebody who whose opinion I trusted on the topic. They had experience in, you know, marketing or, you know, merchandise. And I'm like, what's wrong with this? And, you know, they're like, first of all, they thought it was a brilliant idea, so that made me feel better. But they're also like, well, maybe you should tweak the price a little bit. And when when she said that, I was like, oh, well, have you ever heard the saying, if, if it's not selling, raise the price? So <laughs> the next show, I did just that. I um, I raised the price substantially, and they were selling like crazy. Could hardly keep the tree stocked. <laughs> so, um, oftentimes when you know we get these um, discouraging situations or outcomes, it, it's just needing a modification, either in presentation or packaging, or you know, and by packaging, you know, maybe metaphorical or physical, but. Um, you know, there's just so many ways that we can alter it to perfect it. It doesn't need to be abandoned. And so I would encourage people to um, utilize the resources at their disposal, whether that's the Internet or consulting with somebody whose opinion you trust on the topic. Um, don't give up. If it's something you're passionate about, there is a way, and it's just a matter of finding it. So um, maybe if, you know, somebody's 
discouraged with the class registration for workshop that they're having. Maybe they need to look into like uh, online classes. Maybe they could record themselves, um, upload them to a website. You could sell them for a discounted rate, but you know it could go on forever. It's not limited to a one-time deal. So there's just so many right. ways to look at these situations to solve product problems creatively. Right. And then, of course, we're like on Facebook too, right? So <laughs> we don't mind some some questions, you know, not not a lot, but some. <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyway, um, we're coming down to like the last four minutes before we get into the Q and A, Karen. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking time out of your trip there in France to talk with us. And um, wanted to hit it, ask you basically: Are there is there any other advice um, you'd like to give folks right now? Um, yeah, I think probably the most universal bit of advice that has the biggest impact is just it always comes back to that passion. If you're nurturing it, it's going to create some pretty awesome results, and it's always worth it. So I know I keep saying that word, but it really is that important. So invest your time and resources into nurturing it. It's, it's, it's just really great. And how are you enjoying Paris? Oh, I love it. I feel like I'm like on a history and art hangover for like I don't know five days straight now. <laughs> <laughs> I spent two days at the Louvre, and yesterday I was at the Musée d'Orsay, drooling over oh. the Bouguereau paintings. Oh my word, even more yeah. spectacular than I anticipated. Yeah, yeah. Paris does leave a lasting effect. Uh, um, impression on you and we were there for about three days and then we headed down to the Lope Valley and rode bicycles through the French countryside and um, then we took the train yeah took the trains around to the eastern side which I always think is the western side so I'm, I'm so dis <laughs> directional dysfunction or something I don't know I kept I saying to my husband why is the sun coming up over there shouldn't it be cutting he's like no <laughs> it's like the first clue the sun's rising <laughs> But uh, yes, yeah, so then we took the train up the backside, what I call the backside of Paris, where the wine countries are, Bordeaux, or not Bordeaux, Burgundy and Chateauneuf and, mm -hmm. and Champagne, and um, then headed back to Paris where we flew out. So yeah, wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. So like I said, I'm a little, I don't want to say jealous because I'm really happy that you're there, but so let's just say a little envious that I couldn't oh. be there with you. So, Well, likewise, yeah. I would have loved it. Thanks so much for yeah, taking well, the time. Like, maybe we should Yeah, I was just gonna say maybe we should uh, plan something or something. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. I like that thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know where I am. Let's talk. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> um. Anyway, so now uh, Sarah, if you wanna turn your mic on, and um, I'm sure there are probably some questions out there for some folks. Hopefully. Hey, hey guys. Yeah, uh, we have one question here from Kali, and I just want to invite everyone to type their questions into the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Kali wants to know about the luggage tags. What are they printed on, and how did you discover the best product to use? Um, the luggage tags are printed on PVC, and um, it's a product that I, I kind of sought it out um, intentionally so I didn't really stumble across it. It's something that, that I knew that I wanted for my um, for my luggage tags. So I just um, spent a few days researching um, cost benefit analysis on different um, companies, different printers, you know, who who fit my quantity base the best because you know I, I had a pretty set budget of what I needed um, and then different print runs that I wanted to get. So for instance, this product, I started out with 10 different images. So that's actually 10 different print runs. And so some companies will offer you a discount um, for high quantity, but every time you add a different image, that's technically a different run. And so they won't give you the price break. So little details like that are really important to flush out as you're um, researching different products and, and um, ways to to create. So like I bought a thousand each of each design. So 
I ended up getting 10,000 luggage tags that I'm sitting on. So um, oh this gosh. particular product is something that I'm probably going to have to sit on for a couple years. Um, I'm anticipating anyway. It, I'm hoping it'll actually only be one year before I um, start bringing in, you know, a good amount of profit. But um, I, over the years, have been able to use a good portion of my profits to invest in a new product line. So um, it, it doesn't hurt nearly as much as um, it would if I just jumped in right from the beginning. So like somebody who's just starting um, merchandising, probably I would advise against getting 10,000 luggage tags. But if you were just starting out, I would probably search for a type of product that is um, a low commitment in the quantity area. So you can start out with just a small number of items and then go from there. Okay. Okay, um, thank and you. I just uh, want to mention. Another... Sorry, Sarah, let me jump in here real quick. The uh, images that you see of the products, if you like any of them, go to Karen's website, KarenWhitworth.com. And um, Karen, I'm assuming that you're selling these off of your website. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so you can go there and look over all the products that Karen has. And if you're interested in purchasing any, I know you'd make her very, very happy. So <laughs> go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question from Laura. Laura asks, do you sell a few things before you start a business or do you start the business first? Um, that's a good question. Um, it, it also depends on like your local taxes and um, tax laws with you know where you live. So I, I hesitate to say you should do this or, um, or not. But um, first I would research what is um, currently applying to where you live. But um, you don't have any local, you know, taxes or um, laws that would make you need to get a business license right off the bat. It's probably not a bad idea to, you know, get your get your feet wet first. But um, you know, that's something you may want to consult with if if you know anybody that's, um, you know, works in that area specifically because it can be a little tedious. But um, the internet is your friend, so look it up online. Linda, do you have any advice about starting up a uh, particular business product? Is that what? Oh, um, getting a business license versus trying to um, oh. start first. Yeah, I, I definitely would get an EIN number um, to start off with. Basically, if you don't have that and you're trying to sell art. Uh, you, you really should actually have that because it protects your social security number. Um, other than that, you know, um, I pretty much do what Karen basically suggested is start off kind of small and, and just keep track. i got a, a great financial husband who keeps track of things for me. Um, and so we keep track of, of you know, the sales and the, the sales tax and things like that. And um, you know, like with my book, for example, which is the newest, uh, the newest venture. You know, I, I had to correct, I had to collect sales tax on that, and you know, you have to do it quarterly. So find out what it is with your, with the state. Um, they do have thresholds, small thresholds that, um, you know, if you're under a certain amount, you don't have to report it quarterly. But if you're over a certain amount, you have to record it, um, report it quarterly. So just check what the laws are in your state and make sure that you're abiding by those. But you know they aren't going to come after you if you're trying to sell something and you're you only sold one or two or three. They, you know, they're pretty lenient when it comes to that as long as it's just not a, you know, high high percentage of sales tax on it. So um, yeah, that's I think what you said, Karen, was was pretty much right on. Okay, we don't have any other questions at the moment, so I just want to let everyone know that they can type in their last minute questions into the questions section. Um, otherwise, I'll throw things back over to you, Linda. Okay, well, Karen, why don't you uh, tell us what's next while we're waiting, hopefully, for some additional questions. What, what do you've got going on other than touring Paris? <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, when I get back home, I'm going to be um, diving headfirst into the preparations for the art cruise. So that's going to be 
fun working on, you know, getting schedules and uh, hotels and venues and all that lined up. So it's always uh, a, a great way to extend the adventure, I, I feel like, because it's almost like it starts before it really does. So is this one not a cruise? It is a cruise, um, but we are going to set up a hotel before and after the cruise because oh, oh, oh. getting off the plane and then getting on a boat is a little nuts. So we're hoping to um, cater everybody um, to really wonderful experience from the moment they get off the plane. And are you taking this adventure on yourself or are you working with a travel agency or? Um, it's myself and the painted ladies. And um, the painted right ladies. Now okay. Three of us who are who are working on the, the event. Cool. So so you're gonna take off the, the artist hat and put on the travel agency hat, huh? <laughs> so. That's right, yeah. <laughs> it's great. And then um and then um yeah, you can't be not inspired after leaving Paris. So I'll be doing oh, yeah, yeah. when I get home. I can't wait. Yeah, I I can I, I can I can understand that. So I was in, inspired to paint when I got back from France for sure. So um, anything else coming up? Um, that's I think that's it. I mean, I'm really making an effort to um, enter more shows these days. I feel like it's it's a good way to set some deadlines for myself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really bad about putting out the fires nearest to me, not necessarily the ones that are the most important. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> intentionally addressing my own weakness and um, using like juried shows and competitions and whatnot like as my um, way to yeah. force a function. Absolutely. So um, I guess we're going to, uh, if there's no more questions, Sarah, um, um, well, we did get we're... two more. Um, oh, cool. Following up from the business question, um, can I sell a few items wholesale to a store before actually starting the business? Do you guys know? Um, businesses um, are probably going to be the exception to, to our advice earlier because businesses need to keep track of their expenses differently than, say, a private individual would. Oftentimes, they want mm -hmm. a 1099 form filled out by the business that they're going to be writing the check to. Basically, it's just a way for the IRS to follow through on the sale and make sure that whoever sold the item is reporting the sale just like the company who bought it is. Um, so for that reason, I would recommend getting a business license if you intend to jump into wholesale right away. Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. And then we have another question here from Gail. Gail asks, do you print your own prints? Can you share any of your sources as to who makes your products? I do a lot of my own printing. I still have that massive Chiclet printer that I purchased. Um, it's like the size of a couch. And it takes up <laughs> a big corner in my <laughs> studio. But um, that is... Definitely not something I would purchase again today because of websites like Fine Art America. The amount of time it takes in mm -hmm. learning how to color calibrate and sourcing papers and canvas and all that, it, it's just not worth it anymore. Um, especially when you consider that you could just order on demand. Um, you could print off the spec sheets from Fine Art America's website. They list all of your prices for your own products and you could put them in a three ring binder for your customers to look through and you don't even have to have inventory. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. I like Fine Art America. <laughs> yeah, so if I were to do it all over again, I would not buy the printer. I would go through Fine Art America. And then um, as far as like cards and stuff, that's a little bit different. It depends how much work you're willing to put into it. Um, I order my cards from Vistaprint, and what I do is I get their oversized mm -hmm. postcard, and then I um, have them scored down the middle. Um, they don't offer the scoring. I have to do it. So if 
if you don't mind doing the score down the middle, that's a great way to go. I haven't been able to find a consistently cheaper source for those yet. Um, and the other thing with Vistaprint, always make sure you search for the most recent promo codes because the promo codes make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, that is all oh. of the questions. So. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I know that uh, Karen has is going to be going out um, to eat probably because you're about six <laughs> hours ahead of us. Well, wait, they <laughs> eat about eight o'clock in Paris. Never mind. You still have two hours. <laughs> oh, so, we gotta get drinks no. first. But uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and wrap up the show. And again, Karen, thank you so much for for oh, being here. You. And I really have enjoyed texting with you and talking with you and and getting to know you a little bit and. You know, please stay in touch because I just, I just think you're so super cool and fun to talk to. And um, you know, if anybody wants to check Karen out, um, her website is KarenWhitworth.com. Um, anything else you want to share in the way of um, websites or anything like that? Oh, sure. Um, I love connecting with people online. So if anybody wants to shoot me a friend request on Facebook or um, Twitter, Instagram, any of that, um, please don't hesitate. Um, I love sharing this stuff with people, so it's um, no hassle whatsoever if you want to shoot me a message if you have questions or hit me up. Yep, I'm on Facebook as well, Twitter, um, I Google+, Plus, all of, the, all of the big social networks, so feel free to friend me as well if you haven't already. And um, I think that's about it. Next month, we are welcoming back Michael Pierce, who's going to talk to us about the representational art conference that will be in Ventura. And I'm actually talking with Michael about some other guests that will be joining us to talk about um, what they will be doing at the conference. So, Karen, you might actually like, I'll, I'll talk to you about this offline, but uh, you might actually like going to that since you're a little closer now in Seattle, um, taking yeah. a day trip or whatever down to that. Um, but especially since coming off of Paris, uh, you, you <laughs> would probably really enjoy it. So we'll talk offline about that. Um, Sounds great. Sarah, back to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys so much for doing this, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we have a special coupon code for you here that we offer to all of our art chat attendees. You can save an extra 10% at northlightshop.com off your entire order. Uh, with coupon code ARTCHAT10, so be sure to take advantage of that if you shop with us. And also, please visit artistnetworkuniversity.com to find online courses taught by Linda. So hop on over there and sign up for one of her courses, and we'll see you guys all at the next Art Chat. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.